Well, the latest road and accident uh, statistics from the Motor Transport and Traffic Directorate show that Ghana's road accident mortality now stands at 1,927. This is from January to August 2021. Now, last month, the figure stood at 1,706, but in August alone, 221 more people have been killed on our roads. This shot up uh, the number of mortalities to 1,927. A total of 1,298 people were injured in the same month of August, raising the number of injuries recorded in the last eight months to 10,597. Are we really in to win the fight against road carnage in Ghana? We'll get talking a bit more uh, into that. Uh, but first, let me share the August data with you to bring some perspective to the matter. Now, between January and August 2021, but before we go to the general statistics, let's focus on August alone, where we recorded uh, reported cases of 1,300, 1,300 with those killed, fatalities I mean, 221, and the injured, 1,298. So those are the statistics for the month of August. When we also look at deaths per vehicle type, we would notice that motorcycle incidents are still highest with 93, commercial vehicles with 74, and private vehicles with 55. Now, looking at the regional breakdown for the month of August, uh, the unenviable record goes to the Great Accra region with 48 of those incidents, 34 uh, going to the Eastern region, Central 21, uh, Western 8. Uh, the Ashanti region is the next contender uh, next to the uh, Great Accra region with 46, then the Volta region with 10, North uh, Northern region with 5, Upper West 7, Upper East 7, Bono with 4, Bono East with 12, Ahafa with 7, OT with 2, Savannah with 4, Western North with 6, and North East with nothing. Let's now take a look at the general breakdown, January to August across this year. Number of cases reported 10,820, uh, number of persons killed, that shoots up. 1,927, and then the number of injuries, 10,597. The regional distribution for that one, the seven, eight month period, 439 in the Great Accra region, 403 followed closely by the Ashanti region, 313 for Eastern, 140 for Central, 75 for Western, the Volta region uh, with 78, Northern with 44, Upper West with 31, Upper East with 72, Bono with 59, Bono East with 88, Ahafa with 51, OT with 15, Savannah with 65, Western North with 49, and the North East with 5. And so the North East region faring the best among all the regions. Now, the director of the Motor Transport and Traffic Directorate of the Ghana Police Service, Superintendent Dr. Samuel Sasumensa, tells Joy News uh, the approach by the service to increase police visibility on the roads, coupled uh, with the establishment of Live Traffic Monitoring Units Department, would go a long way to help address the challenge. Through safety management, it, it, it is basically a collective and shared responsibility. It means that you who is organizing this problem, um, this program, you have a role to play. Mm. Just as the rule, um, the police also have a role to play. The driver unions, drivers also have a role to play to make sure that the accident rates go down. But the police, basically, what we are tasked to do is to enforce traffic rules and traffic regulations. In spite of the fact that we have been on the road enforcing traffic rules and traffic the uh -huh. drivers are becoming increasingly more um, um, indisciplined. They are not respecting traffic rules and regulations. So what we we would like to put across is that every stakeholder should try and make sure that that particular stakeholder mm. is acting or contributing to downsides a spate of road traffic accidents by playing their rules effectively and efficiently. Basically, the police were supposed to enforce traffic rules and regulations. So there have been new initiatives that is on board. And this was currently instituted by, by the acting inspector general of police. Mm. 
Dr. Jogmekufu Dambore. And the initiative is very simple. We are going to add technology to traffic law enforcement efforts. So by this, what we have done is that we have est established a traffic surveillance and monitoring center at the police headquarters over here. And the function of the traffic surveillance and now, meanwhile, the director in charge of planning and programming at the Road Safety Authority, engineer Abdon Ting, says reducing road carnage can best be achieved by a change in attitude by road users, something he describes as the sure vaccine to fixing the menace. I've all seen that in terms of public education and sensitization, it's gone up. Whether it is negative or positive, people are aware of, of, of the road safety, the risk we take. And then the measures we must all do. And that's why I'm saying that the vaccines are already out there. Now, one of the vaccines is, is the roads. One of the vaccines is about enforcement. And I think that now we are moving gradually away from now dealing, dealing with the, the human attitude with just talking. Mm. But we must go with the kind of systems that can compel. And I'll use, I will repeat that word, compel, force people to do the right thing. And one of the things coming up is the police enforcement technology that they are bringing on board. Mm. I think we must encourage it, we must support it. These are systems that are being used across the world and has put them in a position where if we compare statistics, then you see that they are doing better. Better means that the systems are there. They are monitoring. They have eliminated the human interaction. And so cameras are watching all day, 24-7, apprehending individuals who flout the law and punishing and that is where I come to what you have just said. Punishing with tickets, with other sanctions, that will make people do the right thing. They will fear the system. I think that this is where we are. And so in the next advocacy that we are coming up, we're going to support the police to enhance, to spread out, and widen the scope of this technology idea that they have brought on board, surveillance system. But beyond the surveillance, should be the prosecution where the ticket system would now have to be applied. I think this is where we should be going. On to some COVID-19 related matters now, and Ghana has received an additional 244,800 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines in complement to the ongoing nationwide vaccination exercise against COVID-19. This was announced by UNICEF Ghana in a tweet yesterday. According to UNICEF, the acquisition was made possible through the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Trust mechanism by the African Union and supported by the World Bank and UNICEF. Total cases are recorded in Ghana currently stand at 120,003. Of this number, 1,047 have died from the disease with 112,099 persons recovering. The ongoing vaccination exercise is to aid the country reduce the effect of the disease on its populace and its fight against the global pandemic. So what's the plan for the rollout of the additional vaccines that have been acquired? The head of the expanded program on immunization at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Kwame Amponsachianu, shares the rollout plan while assuring the arrival of more vaccines in the next couple of weeks. The data speaks for, for itself. Uh, Greater Accra and Ashanti continue to be the hotspots, in fact, uh, for all the cases that we have, about 70% or even more, are coming from these uh, areas mm. and that is our focus but of course because you want to engender demand you'd also want to give some allocations to other hotspots like uh, western region central eastern Volta, Bono, Bono East, and the other isolated hotspots that we have in the other not so hard hit regions but mm. of course we have to look at everybody because not, every, not until everybody is protected, nobody is protected. The point is that these vaccines are EMR for some particular people who are known. And so you would not expect cues that you would see when we are doing a fresh vaccination mm. where people who are vaccine naive, in other words, they've never received a vaccine before, are supposed to go to centers for the vaccine. These are people we have picked up from the database. So it's, it's earmarked. And that is why we came up with a date. Of course, some of them, interestingly, have also received those who are, who are eligible, so to speak, who, have, who are supposed to be receiving these vaccines. Some of them have already received the first, uh, the second. And so, of course, we have the opportunity to move on to other people who need the second dose. So it's been good.
uh, to date, we've done about them. Um, so in fact, many of the regions have finished. There are one or two who, which are still yet to start because they had wanted to finish the Johnson & Johnson, the small doses that we gave them so that we, they don't get... Okay. Now, the Director General of the National Disaster Management Organization, Nana Ajeman Prempe, has appealed to persons living along the White Volta to move and join relatives and friends for the period that the Bagri Dam will be spilled. He said given the impact of the continuous heavy downpour Wednesday night, there was the possibility the dam would be spilled anytime soon. The Director General of the National Disaster Management Organization made the appeal when he visited some chiefs to appreciate the effort they are putting in sensitizing their people on the havoc the spillage would cause. He said disasters are natural, but there are some measures that can be put in place to mitigate its effect. In the northern part of the country, you know already the whole land is saturated with flats all over the northern part of the country. And we are worried, we as NADMO and government is worried because one, we are losing lives, and two, the good people of this part of the country are harvesting their maize and other crops immaturely, which is not a good thing because it might affect the local food problems and food security in the country, so we are worried. But it is a natural disaster. There's nothing you can do about it. As you recall quite recently, in Europe, all European countries experienced uh, floods. In America, in New York City, everywhere we experience floods. That is a natural disaster. But we can prevent some of the effects, and that is why we are here. We are doing sensitization all over the place, so that people, especially those who are living along the rivers, who move to go and stay with their friends and relatives, for the period the Bagre Dam will be spilled. We all know the Bagre Dam is full at any moment from now. If the rain doesn't stop, we're going to get the spillage. We are sure that government is ready with much relief to lessen the effects of the spillage on its residents. I, 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 I know the media is always quick to ask questions about relief items when there's a disaster. But when there is a disaster, the first thing you look at is the search and rescue aspect of it. Then we do assessment to know which kinds of uh, relief items you send to a particular place. But I want to assure you that government at NADBO is ready with much relief items to respond, to mitigate whatever the effects. The chief of Tolong, Alaji Yakubu Alahasan Tali, thanked NADMO for recognizing their effort and assured that they will continue to support in every bid. He blamed some of the disasters on shoddy work done by contractors and choke drains. You know how all the contracts to people to work on the roads, to work on this. They are building and they not sharing with them who will be able to get this water on the river. They are trying to do more benefit than them. Yes, uh, excuse me, I wanted the contract to go back to back. That's how you do it. Now, in a related development, Roads and Highways Minister Kwesi Amuakwata has been touring the Tamale Township, where he observed that some major roads in the municipality require redesigning to reduce the impact of floods in the region. Martina Bugri was with him on the tour and filed this report. Monday's floods in the northern region capital Tamale and Ace Enverance will go down history as one of the heaviest in the area. The rain destroyed several properties and also affected roads. Inspecting these roads to assess the damage done, the Minister of Roads and Highways, Kwesia Mwakwata, said there was the need for the redirection of drains, construct more and design the internal roads of the metropolis to control floods. The impression I have, starting from Tamale internal roads, we have a big, 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 big problem, and we have a big challenge. 
I think we have to look at the design of internal rules of tamale differently. Because I have realized that there are about two main storm drains, long ones running through Tamale. And Tamale Township has a problem. We have to look at it properly, redesign the internal uh, roads, redirect the, the channels, build more uh, drains to control particularly the rain uh, waters. Tamale is in a mess. And if we don't engage in that assignment, Tamale will continue to have problems any time it rains. The minister who also assessed roads in the Savilugu and Nanton district said there were some of the roads who were so bad that they were unaccessible and needed a helicopter to assess these roads. There are some areas that we can't even assess by road. And again, thanks to the uh, uh, Ghana Air Force, you know, tomorrow they are assisting us with a helicopter for us to have an aerial view of all the disaster areas. So perhaps I'll be able to give a fair comment tomorrow before we move to Upper East. And as we did in uh, Upper West, where the situation is now under control, same is going to be done for here. At the Kalaraga community, where they have had two floods already in the year, he described the storm drain running in the area as substandard. You don't even need any engineering mind, engineering brain to know that the work done there was not perhaps well designed. Well, somebody would call it substandard, you know, and there was no proper coordination, you know, because you saw that even the storm drain constructed there you know, had already uh, fallen in. The minister earlier visited the Northern Regional Minister, Alaji Shani Alahassan Shaibu, to have first-hand briefing on the situation before hitting the ground. There's a historic building there. They all ran up there because they thought that water was coming. They didn't know that the fuel that was under was coming up. Yes, I have the pictures on my phone that I would share with you later. So we had to cordon off the place for uh, the safety of, of people. We thank God that uh, we didn't re register any human casualties, mm -hmm. but we registered human losses, uh, property losses. Mm -hmm. uh, people really lost property. But we are we're fortunate not to lose human lives. Now, government has launched a One Teacher, One Laptop initiative with the hope to improve on academic work in schools. Beneficiaries include teachers at the preschool all through to the secondary school level. Education Minister Dr. Yaweduchum says the provision of the laptops to teachers forms part of government's digitization agenda. He is confident the laptops will help improve teaching and learning outcomes. Uh, today is a wonderful day. It's a, a dream come true for my colleague uh, teachers who are going to get the opportunity to begin to practice uh, what we have been preaching about for a long time. A teacher who is equipped with the requisite ICT tools to embark upon teaching from a 21st century our perspective in terms of the skills and impartation to students. You see, technology not only enhances teaching and learning, it also uh, 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 enables students to acquire certain skills that they will otherwise not acquire 
if you were teaching uh, with the, only the uh, tools that we've been using for, for many years. Of course, today is not a day for me to give a, a speech here, but I'll just tell you that uh, we are very grateful that uh, we have the Vice President here uh, who is launching such a wonderful project and program for us. Well, the Vice President, Dr. Mohamedou Baumia, launched the initiative a while ago. Under the One, Lap one Teacher, One Laptop program, each teacher at every level of education, from kindergarten to senior high school, will receive a laptop. Each teacher from kindergarten to senior high school. This is a novel, this is novel in our educational service delivery thus far in the history of Ghana. Government pays under this program, government pays 70% of the cost of each laptop while the teacher pays the remaining 30%. The laptop, however, becomes the personal property of the teacher and serves the benefit of providing a tool for developing the teacher's professional and personal capacity. One of the lessons we have learned as a country with the outbreak of COVID-19 is the urgent need to ensure that we blend the traditional physical contact with virtual platforms in the delivery of quality teaching and learning. We recognize that the transition will not be easy, both for teachers and learners, but we must start. And the government recognizes the need to provide Well, on the back of that event, I'm going to be interacting with my colleague Faustina Safu, who attended the launch and joins us live with more details. Fausti, uh, we understand the Director General of the Ghana Education Service was also at the event. Uh, what exactly has he been saying? Faustina, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you, Benjamin. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, loud and clear. Now, you are at this event. Uh, we know the Ghana Education Service was also represented. What exactly has, uh, you know, the, the director been saying? Well, the director general of the Ghana Education Service um, has been assuring that the laptops will be distributed to all the teachers at all levels across mm. the country. Now, if you recall, just this week, the service released a statement warning heads of schools to ensure that they deliver names of teachers who are actually teaching because it has come up in the past that these names that they have forwarded previously were mm. of individuals who are retired staff or non-teaching staff. So mm. he's assuring that this time the laptops will get to the teachers themselves and everyone gets a piece of the laptop. I see. So, so some quality control there to ensure that the right people... Uh, get them. Beyond that, have we, do we know anything about uh, the rollout? When exactly these teachers are going to be access these, be able to access these laptops? Yes, immediately with immediate effect, it has already taken off. And even at where we launched the event, some teachers who were present actually received their laptops. They spoke to us; they were so excited, but they were, however, concerned for their other colleagues in rural Ghana, which they are not too sure how the distribution process would be. And they are hoping that it gets to every teacher in the country, just as the president has promised, the vice president has promised. So beyond that, you've been interacting with some of the teachers. What are some of the things they've told you? Well, they're excited, um, so excited to receive the laptop. They say it's been a long time coming and that in the COVID-19 era, where they had to be locked up, as well as their pupils unable to access teaching and learning, it opened and exposed the gaps in the educational sector. And so this has been long coming. And they are hoping that government would come up with more policies and more initiatives that will help the teachers in the country. Faustina, thank you very much for connecting with us. Faustina Safo is my colleague, and she has been live at that event. 
Now, customers of the defunct gold dealership firm, Men's Gold, have been accused, have accused government of lack of commitment to prosecute chief executive of Men's Gold, Nanapia Mensa, popularly known as Nam One. It comes as an Accra High Court, an Accra Circuit Court yesterday adjourned yet again the case involving the Men's Gold CEO. This is the third time the case has been adjourned this year. It was first adjourned in May and then in July after the prosecution failed to file the necessary processes and also appealed for additional time. The court has consistently warned it would be forced to strike out the case should the prosecution fail to do so. Here's an update on yesterday's court proceedings. The case of the chief executive officer of gold dealership firm Men's Gold Ghana, Nana Pia Mensa, has been adjourned to October 11, 2021. This was because the prosecution was yet to file any process on how the case should proceed. At the last court sitting on July 6, the court was informed that the accused person was coughing and was asked to see his doctor. When the case was called, ACP Sylvester Asari was not present, but the lawyers of the accused persons indicated to the court that they were yet to receive any processes from the prosecution. Earlier, when the case was called on May 27, the prosecution indicated that it was unable to file the processes as per the court orders. On Thursday, the circuit court in Accra adjourned the case to October 11, 2021. We'll hear from a representative of the customers in reaction to these adjournments much later in the bulletin. In the meantime, we break for business. And welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. We will be buying locally grown chicken at a more subsidized price in a year or two because Venkumatic Group, a Dutch poultry company, is coming to Ghana. Now, Venkumatic Group is a company that offers solutions in housing, egg handling, and climate control for any type of poultry house. The company, in partnership with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and the Ministry of Finance, will be establishing branches in the Greater Accra, Ashanti, and Northern regions with investments worth $200 million. There's more in this report. A Dutch poultry company, Venkomatic Group, is collaborating with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and the Ministry of Finance to set up branches in the Greater Accra, Ashanti and Northern regions. The presence of the company will increase the number of hatcheries in the country to minimize importation of day-old chicks, which will lead to a reduction in the price of chicken. Here is Samuel Debra, consultant for Venkomatic Group in Ghana. The partnership that we are talking of, they are they have gotten the loan for us to uh, invest in this particular project. Okay, so the partnership is going to be the Ministry of Agri and then a private uh, 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 partner who will come and run the system. Okay, to repay the loan back to the bank. And they've gotten um, 36 million euros for this particular project for three setups, and these are pilots. Okay. Afterwards, then we move to the other regions to, you know, establish some over there. And we've earmarked um, uh, Ajusu in the Ashanti region, okay? And then we're uh, going to do the uh, Guinea uh, fowl processing in Tamale. Okay. Technical lead of USDA's Ghana Poultry Project, Ramon Dente, believes that the presence of the group will lead to increasing market share of the poultry industry and make use locally the 2 billion CD fund allocated for importing poultry. It's widely held that Ghana imports about 350,000 metric tons of poultry meat. So the idea is that we are trying to close that gap. Because if, if we ban it now, we cannot feed ourselves. There'll be food insecurity in Ghana. So the idea is that if we want to um, supply maybe up to 25% of that number, that means we need to produce up to almost 60 million bears a year. And that translates in the amount of feed that we need to give them, the day we check the breeder farms, the hatcheries, all the facilities, we don't have it now. So this is the first step towards increasing the market share of the local poultry sector in Ghana. The $200 million investment is expected to provide about 3,000 direct jobs in the country. This is a step to implementing government's nationwide chicken and guinea fowl production, processing and packaging projects. Now, the National Pensions Regulatory Authority has moaned the low percent of working population enrolled on a pension scheme only 1% out of the 
85% of the working population, according to the MPRA, is paying their pensions. Now, according to managers of the scheme, they are rolling out a nationwide strategy to whip up interest and encourage enrollment, especially amongst the informal sector. Mona Lisa from Pong has more. Stakeholders in the pension sector have observed private businesses and the public's confidence in pension fund management companies have dwindled over the past three years. This was after the Securities and Exchanges Commission revoked the licenses of some pension fund management companies. Vice Chairman of the Association of Ghana Industries, Ashanti, Bono and Ahafu Regents, Kwesi Nyamiche, says the situation is dire. The, the private sector um, is always looking at um, the benefits that will accrue to it. Okay? We are business people and we look at what will bring benefits to us. Most of the time, it is the insurance people who have not lived to the, the expectation of the private sector. Now, looking at what is coming up, it looks more like um, it's becoming a bit promising. So, um, if it continues like that, the private sector will be willing to contribute. We all want uh, a better pension when we go um, on retirement. Officials of NPRA, for instance, say workers in the informal sector so far have shown the least interest in the three-tier pension scheme. Stakeholders in the pension sector therefore observe little understanding and participation of the Ghanaian in pension schemes. NPRA is therefore encouraging workers in the informal sector to enroll in other schemes regulated by the authority. Alex Owusubwache is the zonal head of the NPRA in Ashanti region. As a regulator of the pension industry, we see to it that the, all the trustees who are involved with you know, running all the schemes, various schemes in their country, are doing their job as expected. And because of that, we also do sensitizations. We do like what we've done today. Almost all the programs that these trustees do, we also do it because in conjunction with them so that we'll be able to rope in more people because as we, we have already stated, almost 80 to 85 percent of Ghanaians are in the informal sector. To be able to group up these people into the for, uh, pension scheme is what we are about. This was revealed at the launch of a flexible retirement savings plan for informal sector by Negotiated Benefits Trust Company. The company is taking steps to enlighten the informal sector workers on the benefits of retirement benefit or pension schemes membership. And that's business. More coming up at the top of the hour. Up next, sports. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the sports segment with me, Rick Wampo for Ghana would be in action today and Black Stars coach Charles O'Connor is confident his side has what it takes to impress Ghanaians in the 2022 FIFA World Cup qualifiers. Ghana begins its qualifying campaign tonight when they host Ethiopia at the Cape Coast Stadium before traveling to Johannesburg for the clash against South Africa three days later. Coach O'Connor expects the Black Stars to begin on a winning note. We want to win, we want to start very well like the captain said, um, but of course there are, is a journey and that uh, to the beginning of, from the beginning of the game to the end, it's not going to be just, it's not going to be easy. Once the game is going, going tough for us, we still need them to support us. But I'm aware, I'm very, very courageous, I know that my boys are ready. We, we want to try as much as we can. This is a World Cup match and it's six matches and I think by the sixth match we want to be on top. This means that we need to be focused. Uh, whether somebody asks a question that you know it's not, it's not an issue, we, we want to be focused and, and start very, very well. Uh, I trust in my boys that they will deliver. Now, ahead of the big uh, Black Stars World Cup qualifier, we mark 10 years of the passing of a large slider, the man who produced a big chunk of Ghanaian players who featured in the maiden World Cup appearance in 2006 in Germany. Slytheta, who is the founder of Liberty Professionals, produced the likes of Michael Asian, Sulemuntari, Bafojan, and Asamojan, who is now Ghana's all-time top scorer. The under-20 FIFA World Cup winning coach Selastete also came from his table. How best do we remember Alaji Slytheta? My colleague Nathaniel Wato covered some of Alaji's football exploits. 
Haji Ibrahim Slaitete was cool, calm, collected, and a relatively quiet gentleman. But away from all of that, he was one of Africa's most powerful football administrators, considering the fact that he had very strong ties and relationships with heads of federations across the continent, and also the then president of the Confederation of African Football, Isa Hayatu. It was because of this relationship, for instance, that he was able to push the then Ghana FA president, Kwesi Nyantichi, through the corridors of CAF to go through the ranks and eventually become vice president of the continental body. Alaji Slaitete had also a lot of great vision and had established two academies, one of them in Agbadrafo in Togo and the other in Kenya. The Liberty Academy in Togo, for instance, produced a lot of good players who at a certain point formed about 80% of the playing body of the Togolese national football team. His strong ties with agents and great ones at that across Europe and other big football destinations around the world got a lot of his players to benefit greatly and ply their respective trades in other football destinations. At a club like Udinese, for instance, in the Italian Serie A, Liberty professionals almost had an automatic slot every other football season due to Alagi Slaitete's strong ties. It is rather unfortunate that after putting up all of these great structures, his flagship brand, which is Liberty Professionals Football Club, the Scientific Soccer Lads, find themselves in the second tier of Ghana football. It is hoped that as this 10th anniversary of his passing is being celebrated by the Ghana football family, the Liberty Professionals family, led by his partner, Mr. Felix Anson, will pull themselves together and push hard to make a return to the Ghana Premier League. May Allah keep the soul of Alaji Slaitete, a legend of Ghana football. Nathaniel Atto for Joy Sports. Well, that's how we wrap up the sports. But a reminder that we'll be bringing you live commentary of Ghana's first uh, World Cup qualifier for the 2022 World Cup. And uh, that would be on Joy FM. Build up starts at 6 30, and then the commentary proper starts at 7 p.m. My name is Aurelio Kwampofo, and that's the sport for now. Thank you for staying with us on Joy News today. We brought you that story initially about men's gold customers who are dissatisfied. Well, Fred Forson is a spokesperson for the men's gold customers, and he joins me in the studio. Now, uh, Fred, you are clearly not uh, satisfied with some of what you know, has transpired, and uh, you are clearly unhappy with the state prosecutors who have not filed the necessary processes, as well as the fact that we've heard that Namwan uh, or Nanapia Mensa has not uh, been too well. But that hasn't convinced you. Uh, why is that? Yes, uh, clearly, uh, uh, right from the beginning, we had said and suggested that um, instead of going ahead with criminal prosecution, government should set up a tripartite committee to look into the matter. But it's quite unfortunate. And we have been vindicated three years now. Nothing is happening. Government has been very lazy. The, the state prosecutors have been very lazy. And we can clearly see that government is disinterested in this whole matter. That is why we don't believe that the, the, the government is committed in helping or assisting the customers to retrieve their money. For three years now, people's investments, over hundreds of thousands of people have had investment locked up in a firm that is recognized by the state. And look at the attitude of the prosecution at court. The last time it was number one coffin. Today, the prosecution was not able to file his document. I mean, how, which country can we have this? So clearly it tells you that government is not committed in ensuring the welfare of the people of Ghana. You know, this thing is affecting more than one million people. Okay, churches are involved, a group of companies other smaller financial institutions are involved. People's investment have been locked up. Not less than 90 people have died. And we don't see our workplace. So for us, here is our stone. Government has failed. And nobody can convince us that government is interested in prosecuting number one. Because you cannot tell me that which kind of in uh, investigation takes 
three years to to do. I mean, I don't even know what to say again. Look at uh, are, how. Are, are there any other? Are there any other options you're going to explore? I mean, sure, sure, the... sure. But what I want to make it clear is that this money will be retrieved, no matter what, with this government or with Nam One. This money will surely be retrieved. That one, mark it today. The locked up funds of men's gold customers, no matter how long it takes, it shall surely be retrieved. So I want to use this medium to appeal to our customers to remain calm. Our locked up investments will be retrieved. We shall follow the due process. We shall use the right channel and it shall be retrieved. Because well, we are, we, we are not happy with the prosecution. We have no interest. That's why we suggested to them as far back as 2019, 17th uh, August 2019, we came with a petition to the Attorney General. Instead of going ahead to prosecute the gentleman, set up a tripartite committee to retrieve our money because retrieving the money is key. Okay. It's not about Thank prosecuting you. Thank the you gentleman. Thank you very much, uh, Fred. And uh, I, uh, I know you're going to push other mechanisms in order to retrieve the money, like you rightly say. But thank you very much for joining sure. uh, the mm -hmm. conversation. Uh, that is the PRO of the Men's Gold customers who have been uh, actually affected. And it's a wrap on World News. Uh, thank you very much for your company this afternoon on Joy News Today. My name is Benjamin Akako. Thank you for your company. Thank <music> you.